Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, like they say in the movie theaters, can I remind you all to silence your um, your phones and uh, beepers? <clears throat> um, we really have a very special lecture uh, today. I, I think um, we are moving towards uh, developing an autism institute, uh, both here at Children's to uh, collaborate with the Autism Institute that has already been established at DGW and is directed by Kevin Pelfrey, who's here with us uh, today, who's a faculty member both here and at GW, <clears throat> as well as Lauren Kedworthy, who is uh, director of our um, Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders uh, at uh, Children's National, and uh, with Josh Corbin, who is the interim director of our um, Center for Neuroscience Research uh, and directs the uh, preclinical uh, autism uh, program here. And of course, Vittorio Gallo, our chief research officer, <clears throat> who directs our Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. So I wanted to say just a few words about uh, um, Kevin and um, about Lauren before they, they begin. So, um, uh, both are uh, professors uh, at uh, George Washington University, and um, Lauren uh, received her uh, BA at Yale and her uh, PhD in uh, psychology from University of uh, Maryland, and then did her residency and uh, postdoc uh, in neuropsychology at uh, Harvard at Children's uh, in Boston and at Johns Hopkins, uh, and also at uh, uh, Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital in uh, in Baltimore, and she's been on the faculty here uh, since uh, um, 2005, <clears throat> and has uh, over 60 peer-reviewed articles, and is co-author of the internationally known brief um, uh, profile for executive function deficits that's used uh, by. Um, universities and clinics uh, throughout uh, the country and the world for that matter. And her um, recent uh, publications focus on the role of ex executive function in autism and its treatment and specifically the development of a curriculum that's called Unstuck and On Target that has become a book um, that really has been one of the most effective approaches towards treating children with autism. Uh, Kevin Pelfrey did his PhD uh, at uh, the University of uh, um, North Carolina and was an undergraduate at North Carolina State. Uh, and while he was there, he took his uh, psychology course under the direction of Kurt Newman's father, who was a professor uh, at uh, NC uh, State and a very famous uh, psychologist. And um, Kelvin is now the um, uh, Carbonell Family Professor and Director of the Autism and Neurodevelopmental uh, Disorders Institute at uh, GW. And his, uh, the focus of his team is on the basis of autism spectrum disorders, uh, developing uh, biologically based tools for detection, stratification, and to develop individually uh, tailored treatments. So the work that he and uh, uh, and Lauren are doing are really very synergistic, as you'll see from their talks today. And uh, he currently is principal investigator of the NIH-funded Autism uh, Center for Excellence on the multimodal developmental neurogenetics of uh, females with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and women have been less, uh, and girls have been less commonly diagnosed with autism, but we're now recognizing this is much uh, a greater problem than we thought uh, previously. And uh, this is an international network that he's part of to focus on the, this issue, especially as, they trans as women transition, young women, from adolescence to adulthood. So I'll, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Kevin to come up and speak, and he will be followed by Lauren. Thank you. So thank you for the very kind introduction and for um, allowing me to come speak with you today. 
what we thought we would do is give you an overview um, of the work that we're doing that relates to this concept of, of providing more um, evidence-based, more precise, and, and tailored treatments um, for children and young people who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. And so I want to start us off in talking about <clears throat> the sort of problem that, that seems to hold up the development of, of better, um, more effective treatments um, in autism. And that problem is one of a lack of, of um, a real biomarker, a set of biomarkers that will allow us both to um, <coughs> understand mechanisms of autism, diagnose autism, but also something that we can use that's quantitative and measurable reliably over time um, to give us a hold on what changes with successful interventions. And then in turn, how does that help to um, shape the next generation of treatments. And where we currently stand in terms of how we kind of pick um, treatments for autism. So you know, we'll meet a child with autism, a young, a young adult with autism, we'll do behavioral assessments. And then it's mostly a matter of clinical experience on top of what treatments are locally available that really determines what the kids get. So you know, depending on which state you're in, which um, center um, of excellence that you're close to and, and where you kind of take your child. In some cases, there's no place to take your child. Um, that determines really uh, what treatments they receive. And sometimes that's a good fit, but most of the time it's not because it's not really tailoring the treatment to the individual characteristics of the child. So our hope is to um, create that generation of biomarkers um, as well as novel treatments that directly target those biomarkers. And so I want to try to convince you that we are um, getting quite far down the road in terms of developing a first set of, of biomarkers for individuals with autism. And mostly what we're focusing on is using different brain imaging techniques to do this at the level of brain systems and their function um, in the human brain. And so when we think about, you know, what might a, a biomarker look like, certain criteria come to mind that I think any kind of useful biomarker should, should meet. And so certainly we want something that's sensitive, reliable, and it targets that atypical process. And um, most important part of this is at the level of the individual. So we've done a lot of imaging studies, we and other groups, where we've looked at group differences. So we're able to say, you know, this is a group of people with autism, this is a group without, um, here is how their brain differs. But very little in the way of actually saying, at the level of an individual child, what's going on, and what's the heterogeneity look like. And so um, that's a very important part of developing a biomarker that will be helpful to inform the development of treatments. This concept of predictive of response and informative of mechanism. So, um, you know, ideally we would have biomarkers that tell us, well, for this child, for this treatment will be useful. And I'll try to illustrate that. Um, and at the same time, you know, saying for this child, actually this treatment won't be useful and why. Um, that part is a, a very important part is the why part of the equation. So having that um, information about mechanism is critical. Um, and that relates to third criteria, useful levers to really improve treatment response. If we get at the why, we can begin to think of creative ways of actually modifying characteristics of our biomarkers in the kids, so kind of prime them for actually being able to benefit more for treatment. And of course, this has to be practical. So we've got to be able to put this in every pediatrician's office and it has to be really cheap. Um, so, Starting out at a level of uh, sensitive, reliable measures, um, one of the things that we have focused quite a bit on, um, I'm just realizing we didn't download the movie, so I'll have to act out the point light displays. So basically, we're filming a person um, in the dark with infrared markers. And what you would see if I had downloaded the movies is a person playing patty cake, right? And that's the one on the side. And then on the other side, we simply scramble that up. And so what the subject is seeing in the magnet is this very um, strong display of a social actor versus the same 
movement parts, but scrambled up so that you don't recognize it as a person, and certainly you're not recognizing it as a person doing something that's child-friendly, playing pat cake, okay? So we um, spent quite a bit of time, um, starting back in 2003 when I was a postdoc, um, mapping out in the brain where people process social actions that they view or hear, um, even feel, versus um, non-social actions. And that was a whole um, decade of basic science um, kind of devoted to that. And it turned out to be very useful on autism in the sense that at the level of the group, we could differentiate um, people with autism from typically developing people, and we could say, this is a set of differences in a set of brain regions that tell us um, that people with autism are processing these social actions that they're viewing differently, okay? And the reason why social action is so um, interesting to me is that this is something that, that typically developing people do um, more, well, probably more than um, the moment they're born. So even, there's even some evidence that during fetal development, they're processing the sounds of other people acting. But the, the notion that the minute you're born and you start paying attention to other people, that you, you readily differentiate kind of social actions from movements in the world that are non-social. And that that activates a whole different set of systems that we talk about in terms of the social brain um, quite reliably. And so, it was exciting to kind of see that at the group level, we could differentiate people with and without autism. But the big question was, well, at the level of an individual in terms of making biomarkers, can we do this? And so this is um, Malin's work. And she used some um, machine learning techniques to essentially train up on groups, kids with and without autism, training up these um, algorithms to recognize characteristics of the brain that said case of autism, not autism, right? And then she applied that set of algorithms to a new data set. And at the time, this was actually the first time somebody had done that kind of discovery versus replication. Um, and she was able to quite reliably differentiate kids with and without autism. Um, and but, well, before I say but, um, with boys with autism, she was able to quite readily differentiate an individual case of a boy with autism versus a girl versus a typically developing boy. Now, two things to keep in mind here. One is that we and, and nobody else, um, you know, we're not alone. No one has readily differentiated, say, autism from ADHD. So if you have a case um, in your clinic and you don't know what it might be, um, but you think it's either autism or typical development, then yes, brain imaging can be of help to you, but um, uh, no technique yet with brain imaging or other techniques like eye tracking have readily differentiated two different neurodevelopmental disorders. So that's one important caveat. And the other is that you can see um, that we did quite well among boys, but we are doing terribly with girls. So what's that all about? And that's actually for the um, statistics experts in the room. Um, I have either broken math with the girls or um, they're a completely different population. And so we started kind of pondering that question of if we're doing so terribly um, with the set of brain regions that we're interested in at differentiating girls with autism from typically developing girls, is it the case that actually um, the causes of their autism at a neural system level, the manifestation of it, is completely different than boys. And um, this was exciting and depressing at the same time in the sense that at this point in the literature, so few girls had been studied um, that no one had been able to kind of do a separate analysis. And it looked like everything we knew about or thought we knew about autism and uh, brain development in autism was specific to boys um, because we hadn't looked in girls. And so we did what any good scientist would do, and we wrote a grant to go after um, studying girls with autism. And that's this um, neurogenetics network. And so we're the lead site along with Children's, 
And then we have um, Seattle Children's Hospital, um, Harvard, Boston Children's, um, University of Southern California, University of San Francisco, UCLA, and Yale as our sites. And we actually just added Denver as well. Um, so we have this network of sites that are, are collecting um, samples of girls with autism as well as boys with autism matched on all the important characteristics that you would want to match on. And then we're collecting data at pretty much every level of analysis from um, whole genome sequencing um, up to uh, behavioral expression, brain imaging data, as well as really um, novel data with this latest wave about the actual experience of autism in the girls and young women themselves, which is, has been very important and, and um, very much because we have Lauren involved um, that we're able to do that. And so this is Allison Jack, who's an assistant professor at GW, and she um, has been absolutely essential to leading this effort up. And what she's focused on is this concept of, given that we found differences in how the brain expresses autism in girls, are we actually seeing something of a female protective effect in the sense that the system that readily distinguishes boys with and without autism is this social brain system. And there was evidence in the slide I showed you before that actually girls have an enhanced, girls with autism have an enhanced social brain system. And so you have a disorder um, where you, that features social deficits. And now you have this system um, that we've linked to individual differences in social behavior. And what it was suggesting, um, that earlier slide, is that girls with autism are actually kind of ramping that system up, um, perhaps to compensate um, what's been called camouflage, and we'll talk more about that later, for these social deficits. Um, so Allison's been pursuing this quite um, strongly, and what she's found is that indeed, in this much larger sample now of girls with and without autism, when you compare typically developing girls and girls with autism, then certainly um, social brain systems are affected in the girls with autism. But when you compare those same girls to typically developing boys, you're not getting any real difference. Um, you, they look like typically developing boys in terms of how they're processing social information. And so this was incredibly um, interesting to us in the sense that we knew that there were these sex differences in typical development, and what we seem to be seeing here is sort of a, a crossover of a developmental effect in typical development combined with the presence or absence of, of the autism that's the disorder. And then when we looked at, well, what actually is driving the differences between girls with and without autism, we identified a set of brain systems that really doesn't show up in our comparisons of boys with and without autism. So that's a long way of saying that the system that's affected in girls or the set of systems seems to be very different. Even though at the behavioral level, autism is, is behavioral disorder defined behaviorally, behaviorally with clinical char characteristic clinical characteristics. And in our case, in the research case, we're putting all of these participants through a very rigorous clinical phenotyping, so they're even more alike, the boys and the girls with autism, than you would see kind of in, in nature, in the real world, because they all had to meet research criteria on the ADOS, um, Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and the Autism Diagnostic Interview. And so they're already going through a very important behavioral funnel, and that's all to say, you know, so pause and think about that. You kind of get them behaviorally as close as you can, and the brain systems are still this different. And so when um, kids who are kind of unselected for research walk into our clinics, um, you know, we really seem to be talking about a condition that manifests very differently in terms of the organ system that we would think would be responsible, the brain, very differently in boys and girls. And that, that kind of blew me away, um, and, you know, we checked. We thought, well, this must be a mistake, and kept looking at the data, and it kept coming out the same way. So in doing that, 
one of the things that we followed up on <coughs> is actually being able to leverage this genetic data that we have. Um, so this is an analysis in progress, um, but it looks like it's going to pan out, so I'm showing it, um, even though it's a little risky to show you data in progress. So this is looking at um, replicating an, an older finding, which is that girls with autism require more of a genetic hit in order to kind of push them over the edge to that diagnostic point, okay? So we looked at that, and indeed that was true, but when we looked at where, um, when we found, for example, a copy number variation um, and in, in the genetics, and we looked at where the um, genes are expressed in terms of timing of development based on, you know, for example, non um databases, we could find that in the brain systems that represent girl autism, many more of these genetic mutations loaded in those brain systems in terms of their expression. And so we're getting really excited by this kind of convergence of both the difference in brain systems involved in autism as well as the difference in the underlying genetics driving the development of those brain systems. So, one other way to look at this. So, one criticism um, of my own work is that I focus on social brain development because that's you know, kind of where I started. You know, it's kind of like Maslow's old um, adage, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So to me, autism, I focused on um, social brain development. But another way to look at this is to say, all right, I'm not going to look at a specific task in the magnet. For example, I'm not going to make them look at people moving versus um, other objects moving but instead look at intrinsic brain networks. And one way of doing that, looking at their connectivity, is to look at resting state data. So this is um, Archana's work. Archana is a, now an assistant professor at Hopkins in electrical engineering, but she came to do a postdoc with me from MIT um, and had some really wonderful, sophisticated ways of looking at this resting state data. And I can't... Um, begin to do justice to the work that she did, but I'll kind of give you the, the um, autism punchline from it. So she looked at breaking down these, these networks and getting a, a prototypical set of networks that are affected in boys with autism, and then one affected in girls with autism. Then we had kind of the crazy idea of taking that network and that gave us essentially a, a map where we had, um, you know, a number located at all these different pixels in X, Y, and Z space. Now we can take that map. Um, brain, image, brain imagers love these sort of Tallarat coordinates, they're called. Um, and we all have maintained a database, like the field has maintained a database called Neurosense, where you can plug in a set of coordinates and it will look through um, underlying algorithm, the papers that have been written in the field from most of the important journals that publish imaging data, and it will say, okay, you know, 200 papers have talked about that brain region as doing this psychological construct, executive function, for example. Um, 100 papers have talked about it as a face processing region. Uh, 50 papers have talked about it as a working memory area. So you get the idea, different psychological constructs that map on to those individual points. So we can take our networks from this imaging data that are characteristically boy and girl networks and begin to say in a kind of a data-based way, purely driven by the data, what are the psychological constructs that map on to those networks that are characteristic of boys and girls with autism? And then, in order to represent that and be able to make some meaning out of it, we decided to do um, this kind of Wordle um, analysis. Um, I don't think anybody's ever called Wordles a form of analysis before, but this is a Wordle. My teenage daughter informs me. And um, what we've got here is the Wordle that represents girls, and we've girls with autism, and we have um, loaded the size of the font by um, how confident we are that that psychological construct maps onto a network that we observe as being different in girls versus boys, right? And then we did the same thing for boys. 
And what you see is this very different pattern emerging, whereas boys with autism, we see this sort of social perception, person perception loading. And that's what we have always expected and talked about in terms of one of the fundamental systems affected in autism. For girls, we're not seeing that show up at all, um, but rather we're seeing networks involved in anxiety and emotion regulation and attention as really carrying the weight. And so this is another way of saying that um, even when we don't kind of apply our preconceived theory to the data, it comes out that very different networks are involved for girls and boys with autism. Um, I like to think of this as, you know, we've got a similar, um, similar expression, you know, if, you, if your car isn't running, your car isn't running, right? But until you kind of look under the hood and do some analysis, you don't know what's actually driving the not runningness. If your mechanic looked at it and said, not running, um, so, yeah, it has not running disorder, then you would be disappointed. And if always the treatment was, well, I'm going to hook it up to my tow truck and tow you to work, then you would be really disappointed and probably not want to pay for, you know, a mechanic service. So the analogy here is that this begins to give us that look under the hood, and then we can begin to design interventions directly targeting those neural systems. And that's the beginning of thinking about you know, a biomarker approach or precision medicine approach. So, has this actually worked in the wild? Predictive treatment response is something that I was promising you. So, where we've done this to actually begin to predict treatment response, is going back, for example, to our biological motion data. And in this study, um, this is Pam Ventola, who was the, the clinician that led this work. And what she was doing was um, typical response training which is an ABA-based form of intervention. It's one of the um, evidence-based interventions that are available for young children with autism. And in this case, she was giving a 16-week course of this um, pivotal response training and working on social skills, communication, social communication. And we had brain imaging data before and after um, each of the, for each of those children so that we can look at um, kind of their baseline data, as well as what changes as a result of treatment. And what this is showing you um, is that, uh, actually it's easier to see here, the red here is the group average, okay? So across all of these kids, the black lines are all the individual kids, you have a reduction in this SRS, or social responsiveness scale, total raw scores. And so this is showing that in our hands, the treatment works. The individual difference data, though, I think is, is really interesting. Um, you're seeing some kids who showed quite um, a good gain, a few kids that showed no response, so they didn't change, and a few kids even got a little worse, right? And that's a typical treatment study. You know, what saves the day is this mean difference that says that on average, kids with autism respond. So what's the big deal? Well. For some of these kids, if we had charged for this treatment, for example, we're talking about a $40,000 course of treatment, and the parent, one of the parents, has to more or less quit work because they're going to have to drive the kid to the sessions every day, um, learn some tricks themselves and apply those at home. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very involved. And if there's only one parent, then, well, who's paying for the services? Um, many states don't pay for this treatment or really any services for autism. So it's, um, or don't require insurance companies to do so. So it's, it's quite a dilemma. And it would be great if we could tell parents, well, your kid is a good candidate for this treatment or not. So what we did with our imaging data is to look at the baseline scans and begin to use the, um, response to viewing social motion and looked at the set of brain regions that responded to that and predicted the amount of change. And what we found was that these clusters of, of brain areas, here the posterior superior temporal sulcus, which is a brain area that we um, know is involved in differentiating social and non-social visual, auditory, tactile stimuli, um, a region of uh, um, parietal cortex that is involved in distributing attention, 
a system along um, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex extending into the insula that's well known for emotion regulation, and the system involving the amygdala and um, nucleus accumbens involved in representing the social value of stimuli. These four brain regions together predicted how well kids would respond to this very intensive social training, if you will. So the clinicians in the room are thinking, he came up with a way using brain imaging, which is a scanner that costs like $2 million, to tell me that if a kid is um, attentive and able to self-regulate and be still, if they're, if they're able to pay attention to social stimuli, and if they kind of like me and the whole situation, that they'll do well in therapy. Thanks. That's great. Um, right? I mean, you know, your grandmother could have told you that. So, um, right. But grandma didn't have a way to precisely measure exactly where in the brain that happens and quantitatively measure it over time. And in fact, even our clinicians, there was this strange effect where the more experienced the clinician was, the worse they were at predicting which kid would respond. They tended to um, overstate response if they were more experienced, um, which is a natural kind of decision-making process that happens for humans. And at the same time, all of our behavioral data, and we took every measure you could take on these kids, none of it or any combination of it really predicted treatment response. It was really the brain imaging findings were the only thing that could do this. But most importantly, I am um, literally saying that if these little spots in the brain for an individual child are active and coordinated in their activity during therapy, um, that you can predict response. So if they're active and coordinated, the kid will respond to the treatment. Um, necessary but not sufficient. So now that becomes a target, and this is what I mean by leveraging the biomarker to actually influence treatment, because if I take a child and I find that they have a below average response in these brain regions, then I can do different things to begin to prime them. So for example, one study that we're about to launch is looking at using um, intranasal oxytocin to prime the kids who are having these weak responses to have stronger responses prior to going into therapy. So we're going to do this study with a double-blind oxytocin versus um, placebo and then PRT um, and see if the kids that needed the oxytocin and got it are the ones that now do the best versus those that needed it and got placebo. And so um, stay tuned for that. And the reason why we think this might work is that we had done a study um, back in 2013 where we showed that in children with autism, when we gave intranasal oxytocin versus placebo in a double-blind placebo-controlled study, we were able to activate this brain system that is exactly the set of brain systems that I was talking to you about um, as predicting treatment response. So there's this really nice overlap where we can use the biomarker as the target to then prime, to then drive response. And so that's kind of what I mean by using that biomarker as the key to a more precise intervention for the kids. So last point I want to make is that all of this is really nice, um, but is it practical? So this is my Ferrari and VW um, wagon slide. So I would love to have a Ferrari, um, but I have these five kids. And so among other reasons, I can't have a Ferrari because they don't fit. So. Um, the analogy here is an MRI machine is, is great, but can you really do a scan of every kid prior to beginning behavioral intervention? And, um, you know, I should have said earlier that really about four years of age is the youngest you want to go trying to do MRI um, with awake behaving children. And so if that's the case, is there something we can use that's still pretty cool like a Vanagon, um, but, you know, holds all the kids? not a Chrysler minivan. So, um, yes, in, in this case, we've got different techniques. So we have been um, really pushing the limit down to scanning very young infants. Um, and these are also just more pictures of my kids. But um, this is my son, Lowell, getting his first um, MRI scan. 
But what's been much more, much easier is really going after um, using different techniques like optical imaging, um, which is really a set of pulse oximeters that's measuring cortical oxygen, but arrayed in such a way that we can measure um, and locate a brain response. And we can look at a lot of the same regions, but with a technology that's much easier and much more familiar to um, you know, your average practicing pediatrician. And so this is something that, that's much more practical. And this is just showing that even in three-month-old infants, we're able to see this differential response for typically developing infants um, where we can see, you know, a stronger response to biological motion, typically developing is on the top, but not in babies that are first-degree relatives of infants with autism. So there's this heritable component these babies are, have a first-degree relative, they're at greater risk, and even before showing symptoms of autism, they've got this characteristic lack of, of differentiating um, social versus non-social motion. So now we're thinking, well, can we begin to use this as a biomarker, you know, even this early, um, working with Ashley Darcy Mahoney, who um, is a professor in nursing and a faculty member here at Children's, where we're thinking now, you know, can we begin to actually do universal screening? So um, when my second child was born and I um, was awake for the point where they take the baby and do the hearing testing, I talked them into letting me go watch it and I was like, that's the perfect universal screening setting for you know, kind of processing social and non-social information because you've got headphones playing um, stimuli and you're measuring electrical responses. And so Ashley, being an actual nurse, is able to help me talk the nurses into doing this. And so we're working on, on building this infrastructure now. So that's kind of the, the practical aspect. Now, I um, want to thank the different funding sources for this and now turn it over to Lauren because I, I think what you'll be really excited to see is sort of where we're taking this beyond really just talking about the biomarkers, but actually in a much more general way applying it at the level of, of behavior and cognition. Thank you. Well, that's a pretty hard act to follow, but I will do my best. Um, let me just... Okay, so Kevin's been talking to you about precision medicine and some really elegant paradigms for, for investigating it. And I'm just going to kind of piggyback on that and um, put the, the sort of concept of precision medicine in the context of the causal model of uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, which really is only making a, a sort of a small change in terms of we're inserting cognition here into the kind of understanding of neurodevelopmental disabilities as originating in brain and having important biomarkers in brain, um, but in the end resulting in behavior. And as Kevin was pointing out, this is where we make our diagnoses, um, and this is how we determine if a person is autistic, if they, do they have trouble making friends, do they have trouble making eye contact, do they get trouble with transition behaviors. But um, from the perspective of mine as a neuropsychologist and Uta Fritz and um, Bruce Pennington, who developed this theory, um, we're going to acknowledge that environment's going to play a big role um, at all levels, but we're also really interested in whether cognition is sort of a way station, if you will, between brain, by, because it's changing the way we're processing information, it's changing the way that we're learning and producing information, and that that may be resulting in differences in behavior. And we're hoping that that may enhance our ability to think about precision medicine of uh, the NIMH Research Domain Criteria Initiative, because when we think about what Kevin's talking about in terms of precision medicine, we need to get more specific about the phenotype that we're treating. We want to look at what are the subtypes within this group of kids who have behaviors associated with autism that will help us determine who will respond to which, which treatment. And like Kevin was saying, our goal here is to help this remarkable group of people who have autism, who have so much to share with society, to be able to really fully reach their potential and to do that. 
And we would argue that not only at the level of brain, but also cognition and behavior, there may be important phenotypes or subtypes that will help us identify who needs what treatment, who's going to respond best, and what the outcome is. Now, to, to, I just want to give you a couple examples of how this can work. Um, and I want to start at this level of behavior and kind of piggyback on the first part of Kevin's talk about what's going on with girls and autism. Because what, what females with autism are showing us is a couple things. Uh, we know that there are many more males than females with autism, and Kevin's done an incredible job of talking to you about some of the biologically driven reasons for that. We also know that there's differences related to the way that we socialize girls, right, that may actually enhance their ability to develop social skills. We put a lot more pressure on little girls to look at us to engage in conversation, and therefore we may be intervening and helping them actually to overcome areas of difficulty. But there's another issue, and this I would classify as a problem, and that is that we're defining behavior, we're defining autistic behaviors in terms of boys. And that's leading to diagnostic failures. We have a, a developing and pretty substantial literature at this point that shows us that girls and women are less likely to meet diagnostic criteria when they do have autism. They're more likely to get inaccurate diagnoses. And they require more concurrent behavioral, developmental, mental health problems to get those diagnoses. They're also getting diagnosed at a later age. And that means we're missing lots of opportunities. We're missing opportunities for those girls to be understood by their parents and their teachers and their therapists, to be understood by themselves, and also to receive the treatments and accommodations that they, that they deserve. And in the end, and there's some very disturbing data coming out of um, England on this, we're leaving a group of girls who are getting the diagnosis later very vulnerable to victimization. Sexual abuse is, is shockingly high in, in the one study that's come out on this. So we need to improve our behavioral criteria, and we need to acknowledge a problem, which is that that ADOS and ADI, these top two rows um, that Kevin was talking about, as the gold standard ways that we measure autism, they were developed with boys. They're not sex norms. There's no evaluation of sex bias in those tools. So basically, we're taking a set of tools that we developed by understanding boy autism, and we're applying it to everybody. And that's not working so well. And so one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years at, at the Autism Center is try to understand how that's playing out. And just like Kevin was describing, we all start by selecting people who meet these boy autism diagnostic criteria, right, because that's what we have. But we do have other measures, and they're measures that get closer to cognition, measures like Kevin's discussed, like the SRS here, that is the social responsiveness scale that looks at measures that parent's description of social cognition, social understanding, does my child read nonverbal cues? And then we also have executive function skills. Does my child um, uh, have good working memory? Are they able to um, switch between two different ideas? Are they flexible in the way they think? Do they inhibit impulses? These measures are normed on boys and girls together. And so they offer a window of insight into who are these people that we identify when we start out from these boy-based diagnostic um, tools. And these data are Emily White's uh, from a collaboration between Children's and NIMH, and they're showing you what parents are reporting about executive function um, across these domains, as I said, flexibility or shifting, inhibition, working memory. Um, but the big take home from this slide is, first of all, that that dotted line tells you when you're above that, parents are reporting a lot of problems. Those are clinically significant problems. And then the second thing is that those orange bars are girls and the blue bars are boys. And both of those groups met exactly the same diagnostic criteria. They're matched for intelligence, they're matched for age, they're matched for ADHD rating symptoms even. And yet, what you see is that parents are describing a lot more of these executive function challenges in the girls than their girls and their boys. And now, I have a second set of data that's Allison Rados from our group, and it's showing the same phenomenon now with the social responsiveness scale, looking at those social cognitive. So it tells us, and again, this is a large group um, effort across Virginia Tech, um, CHOP, Children's, and NIMH. But what this tells us is that we need to do better at figuring out who the girls with autism are. And if we're going to set about having more precise medical interventions, treatments, figuring out who's going to respond, we jolly well better understand who they are. And we need to think about this in the context of, of, of gender in, in autism. 
And so we were super excited that Kevin invited us into the renewal of his Autistic Center for Excellence Network um, to add this piece. And what we get to do is try to improve precision medicine by listening to autistic people. And we are very lucky to collaborate with Julia Bascom, who directs the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network here in D.C., one of the leaders um, for autistic self-advocates. And she's a wonderfully smart and um, insightful person. And she's brought a group of folks along with her. And basically, what they're helping us to do is to peel under the behavior to what's going on in the minds of girls as they are behaving in ways that we're having trouble dis discerning, right? So this is from one of Ken Connie Cassery's playground observation um, um, studies, where she's saying that the girls with autism look like the typically developing girls. The playground attendants don't see differences when they look at behavior. The peers see differences, though. And so what we need to do is understand what's going on in that process. And one of the first things that we're learning from the autistic self-advocates is that we can inform our understanding of those external behaviors by hearing about the internal experience. And there's two big themes that we hear. So when a girl goes through that ADOS, that gold standard autism diagnostic interview, and comes out, often a clinician will say, I think she's got autism, but she actually scores as not having autism because she did these social things. She made eye contact. She carried out a back and forth conversation. Well, when you stop and ask that girl, what was that like? There's a couple things they say to you. And one is, that was really hard. That was a huge amount of effort, and I did it in a way that is very different than what you thought you were seeing. That wasn't a natural social exchange. I was like one of those computers where you have to type every command in. I was incredibly uncomfortable, and it took a tremendous amount of effort. And then the other thing we hear is this third bullet down here, which is, well, I actually did that in exchange because I was repeating words, gestures, phrases that I have learned explicitly to use. So I've heard other people say them, or I have rehearsed them myself in front of a mirror, actually, gone home, rehearsed those gestures. That's a very different route to the same kind of behavior. And it, it is leading us to um, develop a questionnaire that will come after a person does the ADOS where we say, how hard was that? How much, how much, when I said to you, what's a friend? You know, and a boy will say, with autism will say, a friend is somebody I sit next to in class, which is not a very good answer because it doesn't get the root of a friend. But a girl says, a friend is somebody who has your back, right? Well, after we do that intervention with this assessment now, when a girl says to me, a friend is somebody who has my back, I say, did you ever use those words before? Did you ever hear somebody else use those words? Because maybe you are scripting or repeating something that you learned in a very different way. Now, the other thing that we're learning from the autistic self-advocates is that there's actually big aspects to the behavioral and cognitive phenotype of autism that we clinicians haven't been very well focused on. And the example I would give you is this idea of autistic inertia, which is all over the autistic self-advocacy community. And it's something that I think is very interesting in relation to kind of long-term, but sort of problematic, and Kevin can tell you more about this interest in the cerebellum and autism. Because what they are describing is that they can be sitting on the couch and have a very good idea about exactly what they want to do next, they can have actually a very good idea about how to do it, but they can't get off the couch. And they're describing a combination of cognitive problems with initiation, with flexibility and shifting, but also a big motor component. And so this, to me, raises a really exciting new area that we can start to think about and bring back to people like Kevin who can then figure out what the heck's going on in the brain at those moments. So that would be an example of where we're probing that level of behavior and trying to inform it with cognition. We also like to think that we support people in integrating across all these levels of analysis. And I, I don't have time to go into it, but I just wanted to put John Strang's project up here. This is the KL2 that he's doing with um, Eric Belaine and Vittorio Gallo and Kevin and myself, um, looking at, at, at gender dysphoria and autism across all those levels of analysis. You should bring them back for grand rounds. It's fascinating. And basically, the take home is when we think girls and boys, we're actually way underestimating the complexity of the gender spectrum in autism. But I wanted to go into a little bit more detail into some work 
that um, we've done over the years with Shandan Bhaja at Georgetown, where we are trying to understand whether with cognitive um, mechanisms, with cognitive phenotypes, we can probe mechanisms of autism more effectively. And the problem that we're addressing here is exactly the one that Kevin raised. Our diagnostic categories are not helping us in identifying who's going to respond to what treatment. There's a huge amount of comorbidity. There's reduced treatment response rates. To, to basic medicines like stimulants, there's a big side effect profile. We need to think more precisely to help guide who's going to respond to what treatment. And in, in our lab, we focused on those executive function skills as possible um, cognitive phenotypes that will lead us to more specific understanding of who these many people with autism are and which subtypes may respond to which kinds of treatment. We found Karapuliasi's work um, has found strong relationships between executive functions and important outcomes like adaptive behavior. Um, we've also, uh, Rachel Lawson has found it related to anxiety and aggression. So could these, ex these executive function phenotypes, could they identify meaningful subtypes of autism, we ask? And here, I'm super lucky um, that we get to work both with Shandan, a, a neuroimager, but also um, the other person up here is Shazen Yu here in our CRI, who's a wonderful statistician, and has been helping us to use, um, excuse me, she's been helping us to use data-driven graph theory approaches to identify communities of individuals um, who may have meaningful differences. And the way this works, and you can see this over here in this little uh, figure here, is you take a group of people, in this case it's a, a thousand um, children, in this case these are children who have ADHD or autism or typical development, and you look at what are the linkages between them. Where are their dense connections and where are their sparse connections? And we identify communities such as like this red group here who's very densely interconnected and very distinct from that blue community. You don't see many red dots over there on the blue side or up in the green side. And so that shows you that the separation of these three communities. And these communities were determined using executive function data. This is a very complicated slide. I just want to point you over here to this uh, figure on the left and say that this slide shows you those communities that we just identified. On the x-axis down here, what we have are a bunch of components of executive function, inhibition, uh, flexibility, working memory, and you know, other metacognitive skills. And what you can see here are these three different groups that we identified um, uh, using the um, graph theory approach. And one of these groups, the profile, is peaking. And if you're on, on the y-axis, you have z-scores. If you're above zero, you have a problem with this area. It's peaking with flexibility and emotion control problems. And then we have another group where their peak difficulties are inhibition problems. And then the third group where their problems are metacognitive or related to working memory. And now I want you to look at the other two um, sections because these are basically, the, the middle section is our original sample of 300 kids from children's. And then the um, right figure over here is our replication sample. As Kevin was saying, it's really important to know whether these things play out in the future at, from, from Kennedy, from Stortmasovsky's lab, of almost 700 kids. And what's interesting is how similar those profiles are. So what I'm saying here is that we think we can identify these executive function profiles in kids with developmental disabilities and typical development. And we think that they're reliable because we were able to replicate them and also through um, machine learning, uh, we have now devised a tool into which I can put in one kid and pretty reliably, with 94% accuracy, predict which, which profile they will fall into. But even more exciting, we've got initial data th that shows that the profiles have some neural validity. So we're able better than with diagnosis. We are better able to predict um, the, the correlation between the, the neural response um, and, and the individual groups of kids when we use these uh, executive function profiles. So I just want to finish by saying that those profiles are interesting to us because, as Dr. Batshaw said, fundamentally we're interested in developing those treatments. And we're interested in developing treatments like Unstuck um, and its spiraling curriculum of On Target for Life and Flexible Futures um, that target cognition as well as behavior. And we think that if we're targeting executive function, we may be able to identify people who have problems, say, with flexibility, as these 
group of kids with ASD and then this group of kids with ADHD has and deliver that intervention to them effectively. And that's what we've just found in our recently completed large school-based PCORI trial. And here again, as Kevin said, the dirty fact about um, intervention studies is we like to give you the mean and say everybody, you know, there was improvement. And we less often tell you that there's actually always kids who improve. In this case, these are the kids here in the blue, green. There are some kids who don't change. These are the, the blue kids. And then there's always some kids who do worse, right? But what we found in this study, and we found it for autism, but also for kids with ADHD who met our executive function profile of flexibility problems, is that significantly more improved than didn't improve following on stuck and on target. And this is this pre-post score that you're looking at here is whether or not they're able in the classroom to do the basic transitions following rules and paying attention that it helps them to benefit from that setting, to move forward in mainstream settings, and to be successful. So I just want to say that for our next steps, I, I didn't get to mention, but we've been so excited to be working with, with um, Josh Corbin on, on the Autism Initiative, where we're going to try to integrate even more across, you know, genotype, uh, the, the expression of, of uh, genes in, in mice as well as in humans and behavioral data. Uh, we're also, Kara Pugliese has a K right now where she's looking at imaging response to um, one of those executive function interventions. And um, we're super excited to be able to share all that with you. So thanks.